Hello, everybody. If, in case there's anyone in the room that doesn't know me, I'm Joe Greger. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> what'd you say, Klaus? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, like Jack Corfage, I'm also a. I've been around the block a couple times. And uh, I work at Argonne National Laboratory. I've been there 38 years. I've uh, started in my family business, a fourth generation glass, scientific glass blower, and I've been doing this for 52 years now. Those of you that are familiar with the junior program know me, uh, and I'm pretty much a stickler for fundamentals. I don't always assemble finished products. I like to teach technique. Uh, hopefully today, Throughout this discussion we're going to have, you will pick up between 10 and 20 tips. If uh, For those of you that remember when I was the junior liaison chair, my articles in Fusion always had a lamp shop hint at the end. I think I did 84 of those. Um, some of those will be repeated tonight, but there's a lot of you I know that aren't aware of those or didn't... Uh, weren't in glass blowing at the time and don't have those fusion. So the first thing I'm going to do is change my glasses. At, when you get our age, you need a lot of different prescriptions. Uh, but I have a pair of glasses here. This is tip number one. Oh, tip number one is don't volunteer to do a demonstration. <laughs> tip number two is these are called occupational lenses. So they're prescription, they're basically bifocals, but the bifocal is in the bottom and in the top. So if I'm sitting at the bench, I can look through the top when I'm down like this, but at the lathe, I look through the bottom and my neck is in, perf or my, my face is still level, so I'm not doing this with the bifocals or this with the bifocals. And then I use clip-ons on them. which has my sodium filter. And always wear side shields. All right, so the first, uh, first, all this, everything is going to be 90 degree side seals. And it could be very basic for a lot of you, but if you pay attention, you may pick up some things that you weren't aware of. So this is a piece of 25 millimeter. This is 10 millimeter medium wall. I believe it's 1.5. I'll be using this for all the side seals. Um, first, I'll first and least favorite. I'll sit at the bench and do a manual side seal. Want to warm your material up? You don't want to just thrust it into the hot oxygenated flame. I have my blow hose. Again, I, I heat back and forth so when I blow my bubble, the bubble comes out round. Now, ideally, to ease the pain of making this seal, is if you get this bubble correct, it'll give you a good sidewall. To seal your tube onto. And always try to make your hole the same size as the flare that you've made on the side tube. I heat this and flatten the top out. After it cools, I'll just go and pull out that center flat piece. Always leaves a little bead or seed at the end. Now this piece is really deprived of the uh, sodium. If you're working in vacuum systems, you don't want any pinhole leaks. So the best thing I recommend, and I do it with every 
hole I make or every tubulation I make or seal I make that I pull out with a softer flame and less intense, I pull out that little bead. All right, so now we have the hole. I just ream it just slightly to get it round and level. Now, if you can see, I'll show the camera here. I've got a lip sticking out about an eighth of an inch or three millimeters to four millimeters above the side or the top of the tube. So this gives me a better advantage because it's flat and so is my flare. If I had this hole right down on the surface of the tube, then the sides would be lower than the top. So now I'll warm it a little bit. Now make the splice. Now you notice I'm looking through the bottom, the bifocal of my glasses, because I'm close up. You want them nice and soft before you stick them. I like to touch the back end or back side and then rotate it forward. Check the alignment. We've already gone through about seven different tips if you picked up on them. Oops. Now you don't want to hold your flame steady in one spot. You want to rotate it around so you get a nice smooth seal. I like to do the front and the back first. You just carefully heat right on the seal and just a little on the, tube, the main tube side. Puff a little bit. And you can actually see the joint where you stuck them together disappear, smooth out. I tell all the students that you really want this to look like it came out of a mold. You don't want people to be able to even guess that it was two pieces of glass. You let that cool a little bit and then you move to the other side, the other end. Do the same thing. Remember, rotate it. Don't hold it still in the flame. Don't put, here's another tip, don't put your hand in the fire. You probably knew that one. Once you get both ends blended to where you don't see them, see the juncture, I'm always checking my alignment. Again, let it cool, don't rush this. Now, all you have to do is the two sides. Again, I'm rotating, and if you can picture it, it's fur further away here than here. So with the flame, you want to arc it and try to keep that spacing of the flame equally all the way around your arc, and that way you get an even temperature. If, if you don't arc it, if you just go back and forth like this, the flame is closer to this part than this part. So you want to make it even and arc it and blend it. Wait till they move it smooth together. Look from the side. I'm going to do a little more. Now again, be patient, let it cool. If I, go, if I jump to the other side, it's going to start flopping around.
I'm looking, when I heat the glass, I'm looking for it to gravity to have it flow down into the side of the tube, because these are the sides that are going to be thinner. This will be my last heat. Now I have another, another tool here that will be a tip for you. This is my 90, de 90 degree square. You'll notice that the corner is gone. I machine the corner out so I can put it in and get it right up to the walls and I see that it's a little past 90. I have to anneal it anyways. So what Gary was talking about, Gary Coyne, was sodium migration. And I don't know if you can see it there, but when I'm working here it's very hot and out here it's cool. So you get this deposit of white sodium dust. And if you um, just watch that and anneal it, and warm it until that disappears, then your glass is annealed. It's not going to crack there. And that was a very good uh, research project Gary did. Extremely helpful. And you want to take that, that, uh, that mark out of there. You want to make sure it burns back into the glass before you anneal it. Because once you anneal it, there's no, it won't, that will not wash out. All right, so I wanted to change my angle here slightly, just a hair. So if you have a nice flare on your seal, where it flows right into the side, you couldn't get this up into that corner, the point. So you take the point off the square, now you can move right up in there. And of course, another tip is, this is cold, this is hot, so you don't want to you want to make sure you don't break it. So I'm just going to warm this where I put that square just so I don't get a fire check. All right, the next seal I'll be standing for. I'm going to do it. This is my favorite technique, the ring stand. And a lot of people ask, "Well, why do I have to learn that or I'm never going to use that?" Well, if you're in a a research facility or a university, chances are you've got vacuum systems inside of lab hoods. Well, if they break it, chances are it's elaborate and you can't bring it into the glass shop. So you have to do the repair inside the hood. So you've got to learn how to use a hand torch. And like I say, this is my favorite method. And I think you'll see that it's pretty quick. Using all the same steps I just showed you. Warm it. Again, I'm going to make an elongated heating stroke, kind of oval in shape. I need two quarks. Let me close this. This is also my hand torch of choice. This is a Hope torch. Sadly, they're not made anymore. So again, I try to blow this up. Bring the glass up out of that tube. Come over the, after it cools, I'll come over and flatten the top. Reduce my flame, come in here, pull that center out of there. Again, you want to get that last, I move the torch away so it's a little cooler flame, oops. And I pull that little seed right out of there. That will be, if you're going to get a pinhole leak in a vacuum system, or see a flaw in your seal, that's what's going to do it. The other tip, I told you um, that I like to place my tube onto the back side and then rotate it forward. If you're going to get a leak or have a problem with a seal, it's going to be on that back side because you can't see it. So you want to make sure 
Here's another tip. Put a sleeve on. I've got lots of shirts that the hole, there's a hole right there. And my skin. When you're doing hand torch work, you want to make sure you get all the way around. Sometimes people have, it, have trouble rotating the wrist to get in the back. I say raise your elbow like this. Then you can get back there. Try again, when you're rotating around, try to keep the distance of your flame the same off, off the tube. Get it hot, I stick the back, rotate it to the front. I call these one time, one shot seals. With control, you go and heat everything, the sides of the front and the back a little more. Wiggle a little bit, pull it, remove some strain. Check your angle, I'm a little backward. There you go. Check my square. Okay, I'm a little, I, I'm a little fussy. I gotta pull it towards me just a little bit. No big deal. Now I have to check the angle again. And flame anneal it. A lot of times it's a good idea to take it out of the holder and you can look down the sight better. All right, so that's technique number two. Now we're gonna move to this to this one. This is a eight millimeter high vac valve. This was used on something that the arm had to come up that way. Typically they're 90 degree arms. So I wanna take this off and re replace the, the arm to be back in a stock item. So this is a holder I bend up. It's just a double U bend, a U bend with a 90. You want it on there tight, so I'm adjusting my, my tape. That's funny, I had it on before. You wanna get, get it lined up. Still too, a little too tight. Take a little more tape off. I can. I will, sure. So you look at it this way, make sure it's in plane with this. You check this height, because you want it to be on center. You can do that by rolling it on your table or if you have rollers. And you just see if that, that spot right here is going up or down. Um, we'll move to the lathe so he can set up his camera for the next thing. But you could do this on the bench, just like that. We'll shoot over here. Here's another tip I learned the hard way. I saw someone else do it this morning, I don't remember who, but I want to put a hose on here. I grab it like this and do this. You're very vulnerable. I had a piece of quartz tubing I was doing this to. It just shattered, went in here and came out here. So I always catch myself. It's easy to do this, but take the time, turn your hand around and grab it short. Do we need this piece of tape on there for centering? Does anybody know? Yeah. Okay. I was looking for a little bigger piece of tubing. We'll do this. All right, 
we'll just let that dangle. Get my favorite hand torch. I have another favorite hand torch that I use on the lathe. I didn't bring it. That, that's a pure ox. That's another one they don't make anymore. So it's good I'm retiring soon. All the good things are gone. Is that what you said, Ron? So you're familiar with these torches. Oh, yeah. yeah, the good old days. Where'd they go? All right, so you want to get rid of this disaster. I don't see uh, tweezers up here, so I'll just do this quickly. So now I can look down through the top of my optical prescription and not tilt my head like this to see out of the bottom of a bifocal. You want to be careful. This is the barrel that your plug is in and the O-ring, so you don't want to distort the body. Okay, again, you want to remove that little extra piece of nub glass that was at the end of the pull-off. little softer flame so you don't starve it again from the sodium. Just pull that little piece out. Doesn't take long, it will make a world of difference in your end product. Now I see that this tube is a little crooked so I'm going to straighten it. That's another thing, tubing isn't what it used to be. It used to be nice, in the old days it was really crooked, then it got really nice, now it's crooked again. So I, I recommend constantly, if you're doing a, a piece, a long tubing, straighten it before you use it. All right, now I'm just gonna dab in here. Sharpen my flame up a little bit. and make this blend. Normally this arm would be a bigger diameter. You don't want any undercut or shrinking of the ID. This holder you can make in about 10 minutes if you want. Pick a size tubing that's very close to the ID of the, the glass you're using. Any one of you can make these bends. You just want to make sure they're in plane with each other. Otherwise, this will dogleg out here. All right, so that's enough for there. We'll move on to the next.
You didn't know glass blowing could be so much fun, right? All right, I have another holder I use for a lot of quartz work. It's not, this is not quartz, but this is a piece of angle iron. It's stainless, doesn't have to be stainless. It's welded 90 degrees. It's got some teeth in here, some grooves. I used to use baling wire to tie my glass on. Found that the uh, uh, radiator hose clamps work really good. The only reason I have this tube on here really is to um, thought I had a screwdriver here. It's because I like I like to blow for this seal, um, but I'll be blowing from this from the headstock. But I put this tube on because I could get a cork in it quickly when I was ready to do my blowing. I'm going to pick the hole without blowing. Let me switch this around so I can get my screwdriver on it. It doesn't have to be super tight. You just don't want it wiggling around. And I'll put this 90 or so it, my splice will be in line. I grab another hose connection. I should talk to you about the hose connections. I like my hose connections to look like the end of a trumpet, where it comes out, or a tulip, where it's nice and flared, a little weight gathered up in this area. You make your splice out here. You never overheat. You watch the splash of your flame, so it's not going this way, and then this will not heat up and shrink on you. Hope this is long enough to get out. Yep. Not used to not having a lock on this. Uh, another tip I'd like to tell you while I'm setting the hose up here is these lathes, especially the Littons, will last forever if you take care of them. Uh, one of the best things to do is I always have my machine on. I have my rheostat at zero. So when I start it now, I can start it very gradually and it picks up speed to where I want it. Likewise, when I shut it off, I turn, tune it down. If you have this set up here and you shut it off, there's a jar to these splines on your drive shaft. You shut it off at this speed, now you're going to turn it on at that speed, those splines are going to jam again and through the years that will give you a lot of wear. So I advise leaving the switch on and turn uh, using the, the rheostat to do your speed. All right, so. Another tip. A lot of times for the tack rod, I'll use quartz on borosilicate. You have to have it warm, not hot or melting, just a little warm, and then um, it sticks to your melted Pyrex or borosilicate, and you make your pull out with that, and the, um, the quartz will never stick to it. So you, there's no impurities that you put in there with, say, tungsten or tweezers. The only trick to this is you have to find that center point. Now I could have it over here and where this tube is, that's my point. You could put a mark on it, but once you get used to it, you know where to put that, where to aim the flame. It's got to be right in the center of this tube. Well, we don't need to heat that too much. I want to get this going. I know everybody's been sitting a long time. So you just heat that until it starts to get warm. Find your center point. Point. 
Anytime you pull a hole, always try to have your pull centered. If it's on the end of the tube, the, the more you can keep it on center, the better you are. Now I want to pull out that center, get it to pop open. Almost had it, there it is. Now I take my reamer. You have to hold your hand steady here because the glass will want to pull you away off on an angle. There was that little bitty seed again on the last pull. It was right there. So I, warm, I cool my fire off, make sure this isn't going to break onto it. From a distance, I heat that spot. And I just pull it out. And while I bring it over, I'll warm it a little more. They should line up just right. Did I not bring my cork over? Thought I brought it. The, my little cork. All right, that's not a problem. If I had some little green p painter's tape, I could use that. No, that's all right. I'll just close this. That hole got just slightly larger, so I'm going to warm this. Give a little lift right here. You, can you see how that's kind of like a bell coming out on the flare? That's the way I like to make mine. I shoot the flame over the top, not to splash on the hose connection too much. Stick it, concentrate my heat right on the seal and to the big tube, not the small tube. Very light puffing layer. If you do it right, you don't constrict the tubulation at all. And that's done. Maybe should use one of these other torches for annealing. And of course I've saved what I think is the best for last. My last 90 degree seal will be using my rotating vacuum swivel, which I use all the time. Let you all come up after this to, I forgot which way it went, to view all this stuff. This is, the, this is one I did without blowing using this holder. Now I'm going to show you how I did this one with the vacuum swivel. It's also hard to walk in these glasses. You got to look right through the center. So this is my, um, let me get in camera. 
This is my rotating vacuum swivel. This is purchased from uh, McMaster Car. I have two sizes. I have drawings. Each size is uh, one is on one side of the paper, one's on the other. These are used, if you just look up vacuum swivels or air swivels in the catalog, you'll never find them. I have the part numbers. This is out of the hydraulic section. This is a hydraulic rotating union, which means it's also good for vacuum. Unlike your hose swivel has a lot of leaks, you can't hold the disc on a vacuum swivel or a, a, a glass blowing swivel because there's too much leakage. There's no leakage with this. Yeah. So I, it has two valves, one to the vacuum source and a bleed valve. So now it's pumping to this valve. Now the, everyone has used a rotating vacuum swivel to hold the disc. I've, ma I've made sw uh, graphite pieces to hold the tube. So if you look at the side view of this, it's machined out. This one perfectly fits a 25 millimeter tube. I have all different sizes. These, the, I developed these for different optical cells that I have made in the past years. I used to make over 300 optical cells with two windows. I have some samples here. Every year I used to make that many. We need another hose, uh, another tube. I have demonstrated this before, but I, it was a number of years ago. So I felt it was maybe a good time to bring it back. A lot of new members, younger members. To me, this is an invaluable tool in our shop. Again, I just put this on so I wouldn't have to fight and find a cork or something to plug it. I hold it up here. My bleed valve is closed. I open the flow valve. Holds it right on there. It's a good beat, but it's hard to dance to. All right, so here I'm going to make a small hole, just like I did the other way. And I take that little last bead off. Hello? Oh, all right, thank you. 
Philip. I was just about to close it. I always have my graphite and lifting up with it. Now the way I popped the hole, I got a little thick on the top and bottom, so I'm just gonna pull just a hair of that off. Find my, the end of my blow hose. So I got to make that a little larger. I now own a little green roll of painters tape. I moved it a little. Now I shut the vacuum source off, open the purge valve, I can pull it away. And just a little bit of flame annealing, you can shut that off, yeah, thank you. So if you wanna, if you wanna come up and get this one, you can start sending it around. Now, the way to have these graphite pieces made is to have a good machine shop. But uh, my machine shop is always a little unfriendly about machining graphite. So in the early days, when I came up with this idea, I would take the tube that I was going to work on, and I would take silicon carbide grain on the edge of my sink and some water, and I'd take the graphite, and I'd just go back and forth on the tube, adding grit, more abrasive, until I got the shape I wanted. Now the trick there is to make sure it's 90 degrees to this plane, otherwise it's going to hold the tube angle. So it's much better to have a machine shop do it. They use a milling machine actually. And the other key, or there's actually three keys here. One, the rotating vacuum swivel, so you have enough uh, vacuum power to hold the tube on there. The graphite piece, and this stainless steel tube has to be straight. It can't be crooked. So you, can't, you don't want to use a piece of plumbing pipe. So I really appreciate your attention in staying this late. Uh, if, I have, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Camera to look at. <laughs>